Hi, my name is Mike Pettigrew, and today I'd like to discuss the purpose of life, finding our true purpose in life. Uh, a great human being once said that if we want to understand life, we must first study death. It, if we want to understand life, we must first study death. Now, when he said this 700 years ago, there was no scientific research that had been carried out into life after death, and that is completely different today. In the last 30, 40 years, there has been a lot of scientific study of the, of the human mind and consciousness and what may happen after death. There have been several universities and hospitals around the world where life after death has been studied. And, for, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, a cardiologist by the name of Pim van Lommel interviewed many, many people who had clinically died for a minute or two and had been then resuscitated. And the findings of his research that was conducted, I think it was over 13, a 13 year period, was that, and, and this was reported in the British Medical Association's journal, The Lancet, several years ago, but the findings of, of, of this, uh, this study was that for the first time we have scientific evidence that life continues after death. And his findings or, or his conclusion was that we really need to reevaluate our understanding of the brain and the mind and consciousness. And his research has been replicated, been duplicated in many other hospitals around the world with similar findings. And when I first came across this evidence, it was back in 1977, my cousin died in a road accident. And, you know, his name was Peter and we were very close and he was really my hero. Uh, Peter was an incredible person and he was only 19 years old. He was cycling from university to the place that, that he was living at and a car crashed into him and Peter died. And needless to say, our, our family was, and particularly his parents were just devastated. But my aunt and uncle were given a book, I believe, by his older sister. And it was the first real book about the near-death experience. And it was by Dr. Raymond Moody. And it had been published only a couple of years before. And the name of that book is Life After Life by Dr. Raymond Moody. And this book, uh, they gave it to me. And to say I was electrified is putting it mildly. That book changed my life. That book, and uh, Peter's death, sent me on a quest that continues to this day. And my whole life has been really dedicated to understanding human consciousness, the mind, what happens after death, is it the end? And I've spent, well, well over 30, 35 years researching this. And um, I used to be on radio and TV back in 2002, about 78 times, talking about the scientific evidence for life after death. I started an, org an organization called the Institute for Afterlife Research. But I had to put all of that aside a few years later, a couple of years later, when uh, I lost everything. As I mentioned in, in, a, in, in an earlier video, uh, my wife and I lost every single cent in the world. I'd been very successful in business. I'd built my business up to a sizable size. We were millionaires and we lost everything. And incredibly frightening times. But I, in, in those, th that tragedy, you might say, caused or and made me grow in so many different ways. And I am so grateful for that experience because it has taught me all sorts of things about life and the mind and human beings and human nature that I wouldn't possibly have learned otherwise. But this scientific evidence for life after death that I was just mentioning a moment ago, everything points to one thing, the purpose of all human life, the purpose of every human being on this planet is twofold. 
The first is we are here to grow spiritually. Now, that might may sound all religious, but it's not, I assure you. When I say grow spiritually, I'm talking about inner growth. Um, the, it's a fact that our challenges, the bigger the challenges we undergo in life, the more we can grow as a human being. And we see this in later in life usually. We see elderly people who've lived, lived a tough life. And in most cases, they are very caring, very kind, very compassionate, really wise. Now, of course, if that, that individual is, has a very complaining nature, and later in life they can become very bitter and resentful. Not much learning there, but it's a fact that big challenges enable us to grow spiritually. As I say, spiritually meaning those inner qualities. Our challenges enable us to become a better human being. Okay, So that's the first thing. The other thing that modern research into life after death says our other purpose in coming to this world is to also help others. So we are here to grow and help others in any way we can. And it doesn't have to be anything grandiose. It can be just simply having an outward looking attitude and caring for those that are immediately around us. And I had an experience many, many, many years ago, back in, in the mid-1980s. and. Um, I was madly in love with this girl, and uh, we split up, and we, we had been planning to get married, we lived together for a couple of years, and to say my world fell apart in an instant was putting it mildly, <laughs> but I, I, one, I, there were many, many lessons, and that, that experience enabled me to grow in all sorts of ways. I couldn't possibly have grown otherwise, and I'm really grateful for that experience. But I think it was the, se the day after it happened, the day after it happened, I visited a friend, and, you know, I, I literally wanted to cry on his shoulder and tell him what had happened, and it was awful, and I just wanted a bit of sympathy, you know, because I was feeling so awful. Anyway, I, I drove out to his house, I visited him, and he was walking up and down with his, with his head in his hands, panicking and I said what's wrong what's wrong and he said the doctor has told me I may die he says I might I might have AIDS and back in the the mid 1980s if, if you'll remember back in the mid 1980s doctors were wearing rubber suits tre treating people who had AIDS it was this terrible fear and back then anyone who had AIDS it was pretty much certain that they would die and this is what you know, my, my friend believed for him. But basically, he, he was, his energy was really low and he, he, he was actually suffering from what today is known as ME. And um, he, you know, he, he overcame that with, with good medicine, nutrition. But the fear as he paced up and down his sitting room, and I found myself encouraging him, even though I, was, I went there to to <laughs> cry my eyes out, I ended up for the next three, four hours encouraging him. And you know what? At the end of that time, I felt empowered, invigorated. Now, he was as well. He came out of that. He, he realized that he might be misreading things, and he, he was not nearly as fearful when I, when I left his home. But the amazing thing is, I felt totally different after two or three, well, three or four hours of encouraging this guy. My problems had not gone away, but I felt empowered, I felt invigorated, and buoyant. <laughs> My life had fallen apart, but yet this is how I felt. So this is why it's so important to help others in any way we can, because we all have challenges, we all have difficulties and problems in life, and those are there for our growth. And when things are really difficult, 
That's the very time we need to be outward looking. The very time when we need to do our best to help those around us. Because this gives us an immediate holiday from our problems. Because when things are really rough, normally we're in a mental repetitive thought process or cycle. We're thinking about the problem and thinking of it and rehashing it. And, you know, we feel awful. But when we, start, we, when we look outside ourselves and do the best we can for those around us, try and encourage people, even when we're not feeling at all encouraged or empowered ourselves, things change. It's like we start to glow again. Okay? So helping, sorry, transforming our own lives and also helping others to do the same is the mission and purpose of every human being on this planet. And when we, and you might feel that, okay, that's well and good, but you know, I, I want to do something great. I want to be a, a, an artist. I really want to contribute to society. That's incredibly important. It's really important to have really big goals and really big dreams. But all along our path, all along our journey to our, the destination we wish to, to reach, it's really important to, to constantly work for the happiness of others. It's so important to work for the happiness of others, no matter what we have, what, no matter what our dreams or goals are in our lives. If we are stretching our lives by setting really big goals, and at first, if we're not, if we're, if we have not achieved incredible things in our lives. We may have a belief system about our lives that's quite small. And it may be quite difficult to have a big vision for our lives. But as we test this, as we set goals for ourselves, as we practice many of the techniques that I, I explain in my videos about gratitude and other subjects, our life expands. And over time, our goals can get bigger and our sense of personal power expands, we start to become more empowered, and it's almost like a snowball rolling down a hill. It gathers momentum, it gets bigger in size, and I honestly feel that every human being can do incredible things in their lives. We can all achieve incredible happiness for ourselves and others, but we need to set goals that stretch our lives, not little meek and mild goals, Although there is a purpose to that, you know, if we are not familiar with goal setting, we need to gain confidence. But over time, we can achieve incredible things for our lives. One friend of mine, his name is Daniel Brinkley, and Daniel had uh, a near-death experience, I think it was back in 1975, and he, um, he was on the telephone, and there was a thunderstorm uh, going on outside, and... To cut a long story short, the lightning struck the pole outside his home and I think it was 10,000 volts suddenly down the telephone line and down his spine. And Daniel was clinically dead for 28 minutes. Now, science, scientists tell us that after two or three minutes of o oxygen deprivation, our brains are so ir irreparably damaged that if we do uh, manage to be revived, uh, we can be in a vegetative state. That's a general rule, but it's not absolutely accurate in every circumstance because it, there are many cases where people's body temperature has been l l lowered dramatically and into, so they're almost in a state, state of suspended animation. So it's only a, 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 a it's, it's not a hard and f fast rule. But Daniel was clinically dead for 28 minutes and his experiences are absolutely fascinating. Daniel's first book called Saved by the Light is incredible and I urge you to get hold of a copy because in it he describes his entire experience from the time he was struck by lightning to the time where he was revived. And there are many parts of his experience that you might think well, that, that's, that's crazy, that's impossible. But the amazing thing about his experience is there are absolutely real-world verification 
of many of the parts of his experience that prove that it was not imaginary, that it was not the product of uh, an oxygen-starved brain. For example, during his experience, uh, the, you know, the first thing that he, one of the first parts of the experience, he felt himself traveling through a, a tunnel and meeting with a being of light. And this being of light, not judging him, but like being a friendly counsel, but Daniel re-experienced every single event from his birth right up to the point where he was struck by lightning. Uh, Daniel Brinkley had not been a very nice guy. He actually was a Marine and he had been responsible for the deaths of many people and he had to experience those people dying and the, the, the pain and the confusion as each one of those people died and then in every permutation possible how the loss of that person was felt by family members and when you experience what other people, the suffering that other people go through on your account, it makes you, well, he felt pretty awful after this, what he calls a life review. And he found it extremely hard to forgive himself. But later on in, in his experience, he, he was shown 117 major world events that would take place in the future. Now here in 2014, almost every one of those events has taken place. And I met Daniel for the first time in 1999. I was with him in Peru and then later in the year in Egypt. And he, he told me a few things that were going to happen, major world events that he didn't document and they happened. So when you have very, very, very specific knowledge passed on to you during a near-death experience, and then it turns out to happen, something happening there, there's something happening there, it cannot possibly be imagination. And I'm talking about major world events like the nuclear accident in Chernobyl, the changes to the ozone layer, global warming, none of this was, was even dreamed of back in the, the mid-1970s when he had this experience. What Daniel makes it really clear, and he's incredibly empowering, an amazing teacher, and he is very clear on what I said earlier. The purpose of human life is to grow and help others grow. This is the secret of every human being. And when we get on with our life's purpose, we become empowered, we become invigorated, we are joyful, buoyant, and happy and really working for the happiness of others, setting big challenges for ourselves and really growing is the purpose of your life and my life and everyone's life. And I really invite you to test this for yourself, really test it. If you're interested in learning more about life after death, and the scientific evidence for life after death. I will talk about this in future videos, but uh, I have released, uh, I recorded it a long time ago, back in, I think, 2001, and it's, um, in an, well, it's an audio book, and it's also available as a Kindle printed book as well. And on the Apple App Store, you can get it. It's called Life After Death, What Happens When We Die? But if, if you just search for Life After Death, it will be the very first audio book that you'll see. And there's a free version, which includes the first few chapters, and there's a paid version, which is, I don't know, three or four dollars, pretty cheap. And also, in the Kindle bookstore, it's called Afterlife, colon, Startling Evidence for Life After Death. So just look for Mike Pettigrew, Afterlife, and you should find it pretty quickly. The last thing I'd like to say is, our lives are incredibly, incredibly precious. And if we ever do some hospice volunteer work where we're sitting, chatting with people who are dying, we will experience some incredible miracles taking place. I think, generally, we devalue our lives terribly. The most precious thing we have in life is time and how we use it. Do we use it to make a difference or do we not? And working in a hospice as a volunteer, you'll often see patients in their last few days of life 
understand, as I say, miracles can happen. Family conflicts and feuds and disagreements can just melt away. When people realize they have so little time left, they do things that would, they would not normally do. But the reality is, we all think we have lots of time left. But, there, but it's true to say our, life, our lives could end at any moment, in a day from now. So when we live our lives as though today is the last day of our life, we do things very differently. Thank you so much for watching this uh, short video. And if you would like to ask questions or leave comments, you can do so below this video in the space provided. And if you would like to receive weekly videos similar to this, but covering a plethora of different subjects, all related to happiness and empowerment, please fill out the form on the right. And you will certainly not be spammed, and you will just receive one email a week alerting you to any new videos and podcasts that I have produced. Thanks so much for watching.